now of course uh, with this manifesto having been delivered to you in person i think uh, we can welcome your questions and comments good noon ma'am i'm waiting for this moment uh, since i saw the brochure i'm all the way from tamil nadu madurai to see you ma'am i can't believe myself <laughs> i'm still uh, i couldn't believe ma'am i'm uh, raja pravina i'm doing my doctoral research on your non fiction ma'am and uh, i'm half way through and i have one question ma'am that, that can help my research ma'am what does uh, globalization really do to the world ma'am does it really make the world whole into one in entity as it uh, literally means or uh, does it fracture the world into fragments further ma'am uh, if the both happens happen which overlaps the other ma'am uh, could you please help me highlight ma'am see the fact is that globalization Uh, the world can never be a single entity it should never be a single entity and it will never be a single entity so when we talk about globalization we only speak about it economically we only speak about the globalization of capital of the free flow of capital across national borders and isn't it an irony that as the capital flows more freely the borders get more and more militarized you have 30 million refugees the reason is that you need labor needs to be almost imprisoned while capital flows feel freely money can flow freely freely but not people and as you try and make as this global capital tries to create uh, markets it wants people to want the same things as in the same products you know so in a way that urge to have the same shops you go to lulu mall or you go to delhi mall or you go to saudi arabia mall or you go to us mall and you get the same products and the young people are required to desire the same things that is all about global capitalism but as that happens people begin to i think get psychologically distressed about losing their identities their language and then you go into this kind of identitarian uh you know uh, panic so so both things go side by side and i and i have written many many times about how in india in 1990 two locks were open one was the lock to the babri masjid and the other was the lock of the protected market and those two locks unleashed two kinds of totalitarianism one was economic totalitarianism and the other was religious totalitarianism and those two unleashed two kinds of violence both helped to militarize our country and both waltzed together so if i mean whether it's the bbc documentary or anything else if you don't look at both things you you really don't get a radical understanding of what's going on you know if you only want to look at communalism but you don't want to look at the the way capitalism has ripped apart the society that has created the most unequal society in the world and how the anger of those people who are being pushed off uh the economic uh you know battle field in some ways are their rage is being used in ways so the, you have to look at it as a whole so my name is sun i am so delighted to ask this question so my question is from your magnum opus that is god of small things as you uh, described it as an inextricable mix of experience and imagination so writing is just like the childhood experience of a mother to deliver a poetry to piece of fiction is the same experience but here so my question is so what are the stories a society that tells about itself if you focus on the plot of the god of small things that is i mean so so do you think uh, your irresistible longing for literature might have fetched to the particular setting or not so how would you look at this well i think um, you know what i find quite interesting about the the reception to the god of small things you know once i was in the us because a whole lot of uh, schools of you know 
a lot of underprivileged children actually they they uh, in in this whole district they choose one book and they ask the children to read it and then they come together to make projects you know and so you had children chinese african all kinds of kids and they had made such a incredible range of um, work on the god of small things you know the study of caste and class and this it was incredible to me <laughs> in kerala and especially closer to home in aimanam kotem i find there's a fear of that book you know they want to celebrate me book a prize famous and all that they don't want to deal with what the book is really about they say oh it's so charming the language is so charming it's about children and all that but they don't want to address it's about caste you know and how can we just celebrate this person without actually understanding what the book is about or or you know or um, addressing it initially of course as all of you know even the communist party was very angry with the book because it does call out the left movement on not being able to understand what caste is and not wanting to understand what caste is you know so today that has changed there is an understanding that you've got to you've got to you just can't get away with it by saying caste is class comrade and all that doesn't work you know so you've got to look at it and the syrian christians are worse than anybody else on the understanding of caste they are you know like sometimes i come here and i'm like is there such a thing as christian rss because it feels like that to me you know how christian no that is christians who support the rss but in their own practice you know how little do you want to understand how unjust you are how hierarchical you are how entitled you are you don't want to question any of your own comforts but you 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 know you can feel uh, in this state you're not under threat but in the rest of india there have been more than 300 attacks on christians but that is because the christians for the most part in north india poor people are people who converted to escape the horror of caste so you know we are uh, i mean i'm sorry to sound like this but in kerala we can tend to be a very smug society because we have not been threatened by this and my book does question this and therefore you know i get a lot of like let's celebrate the prize and let's ignore the book or let's not let's just celebrate certain aspects of the book and not really look at what it is talking about hello ma'am i'm farasat i studied ba economics in sacred arts college and uh, i wanted to ask you this question that uh, you you are com- you are from kerala and your mother tongue is malayalam and you write in english so so did that affect your uh, conveying meaning like you know uh, in local language you can convey meaning more o- in a more authentic way when you do that in english uh, certain meanings are not a- able to uh convey through english language or uh, uh any other language other than the local language and then uh, i have uh, the second question is that uh, you studied architecture so uh, i feel like some some writers they prefer designing the novel and uh, building uh, it is uh, designing the novel in in their um, brains and it is like a building and some writers they just pour it down and then edit it and carve it out like a statue from a stone so uh, what are your thoughts on that and uh, as a as a writer and uh, many other, many other writers here who would like to know that if uh, you know they should uh, like stick on to technicalities of writing or just write whatever that comes to their mind thank you those are all wonderful questions um for the answer to your first question i would ask you to read the first essay in this book which is called in what language does rain fall over tormented cities so there are very many assumptions you make for example 
Madam, your mother is a Malayali, therefore your mother tongue is Malayalam. Why don't you write in Malayalam? That, my mother is a Malayali who grew up in Delhi. My father's a Bengali. I was born in Shillong. The first language I learned was the language of uh, the tea pickers, because uh, it's all here in this book, because my parents were fighting and they used to farm me off to the tea pickers quarters, because he was on the tea estate. Then I came to Tamil Nadu, from Tamil Nadu to Kerala, back to Tamil Nadu to study. My first husband was from Goa, my second was from Punjab. So I don't know what you want my mother tongue to be, but you know. So, so, and then in the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, and also when, uh, at the time when people like myself were growing up, actually I, I can speak and read and write Malayalam, and it used to be the language of my friends and everything, and then we used to get punished. I had to write a thousand times, I will speak in English, I will speak in English, I will speak, you know. So that was a thing that happened to us in our generation. But I don't understand things like authenticity. You know, what is authentic? You know, it comes very close to then Hindustan is for Hindus and, you know, all the rest of it. So you have to be very careful, after all, what every language, whether it's Hindi or Malayalam or every language has colonized some other language, you know. There's been, a, it's a very complex process of what has happened, even Hindi itself. There's a whole uh, part in this essay about Hindi and Urdu and how language was partitioned before the land was partitioned and what are the influences that happened. So, in the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, for example, all the characters are continuously translating, not I am translating, they are translating to each other. Anjom is translating to Saddam Hussein, Tilotama is translating to Musa, Mu uh, Garson Hobart, is because everyone swims in a sea of imperfect language and translation. So when I wrote the ministry, I used to joke to myself, should I say translated from the original by Arundhati Roy? Because it contains so many languages, you know. So uh, one, one works in this universe of languages in this country and one understands the violence that each language has done to another, also the liberation, also the liberation. You know, I am, uh, uh, I, let me just read the opening paragraph, actually, that'd be interesting, of the ministry, uh, of this, uh, what is it called, in what language does rain fall over tormented cities? As at a book reading in Kolkata about a week after my first novel, The God of Small Things, was published, a member of this audience stood up and asked in a tone that was distinctly hostile, has any writer ever written a masterpiece in an alien language, in a language other than his mother tongue? I hadn't claimed to have written a masterpiece, not to be a he, but nevertheless I understood his anger towards me, a writer who lived in India, wrote in English and who had attracted an absurd amount of attention. My answer to his question made him even angrier. Nabokov, I said, and he stormed out of the hall. Then I'll skip the para on AI, which Venkatesh read. Uh, only a few weeks after the mother tongue masterpiece incident, I was on a live radio show in London. The other guest was an English historian who, in reply to a question from the interviewer, composed a pain to British imperialism. Even you, he said, turning to me imperiously, the very fact that you write in English is a tribute to the British Empire. Not being used to radio shows at the time, I stayed quiet for a while as a well-behaved, recently civilized savage should. But then I sort of lost it and said some extremely hurtful things. The historian was upset and after the show told me that he had meant what he said as a compliment because he loved my book. I asked him if he also felt that jazz, the blues and all African American writing and poetry were actually a tribute to slavery and whether all of Latin American literature was a tribute to Spanish and Portuguese colonialism. 
But notwithstanding my anger on both occasions, my responses were defensive reactions, not adequate answers, because those incidents touched on a range of incendiary questions regarding colonialism, nationalism, authenticity, elitism, nativism, caste, and cultural identity, all jarring pressure points on the nervous system of any writer worth her salt. However, to deify language and freeze it in, in the way both these men has renders language speechless. When that happens, as it usually does in debates like these, what has actually been written ceases to matter. And that is what I found so hard to countenance. And yet I know and knew that language is that most private and yet most public of things. The challenges thrown at me were fair and square. And obviously, since I'm still talking about them, I'm still thinking about them. The night of that reading in Kolkata, city of my estranged father and of Kali, mother goddess, with a long red tongue and many arms, I fell to wondering what my mother tongue actually was. What was the politically correct, culturally opposite, and morally appropriate language in which I ought to think and write? It occurred to me that my mother was actually an alien with fewer tongues than Kali perhaps, but many, with fewer arms than Kali perhaps, but many more tongues. And English is certainly one of them. My English has been widened and deepened by the rhythms and cadences of my alien mother's other tongues. I say alien because there's not much that is organic about her. Her nation-shaped body was first violently assimilated and then violently dismembered by an imperial British quill. I also say alien because the violence unleashed in her name on those who do not wish to belong to her, Kashmiris for example, as well as on those who do, such as Indian Muslims and Dalits, make her an extremely unmotherly mother. <laughs> you had asked some other question. Uh, well, okay. Basically, I think you know, if you read the uh, Ministry of Utmost Happiness carefully, uh, this whole thing about being on the border, that is something which, you know, it's repeated in different contexts, like the, 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 the Jannat guest house at the graveyard, Kashmir, and also these languages, uh, people translating uh, the, what they mean to the other person in, in terms of language. So it's all we are all actually uh, ultimately this uh, this whole uh, uh, argument about authenticity being one step shorter of uh, even fascism. I mean, the claims about authenticity. I think you know it's something which gets that's not a very overtly stated, but it's a it's a it's a thread in the Ministry of Utmost Happiness. So uh, I think you know this is something as youngsters, all of you need to kind of you know uh, really look at this and uh, imbibe this. I mean, just wanted to add that. Yeah. And the, the second part of the question was about uh, do I design novels? Uh, you know, for me, the structure of a novel and the way a story unfolds is as important as the story itself and the language in which it's told. And to me, you've got to pay attention to e an equal amount of attention to all of this. So. Um, anybody who thinks that, you know, the Ministry of Utmost Happiness is not carefully structured hasn't been able to understand the structure. But for sure, it's a complex structure and as I said, I look at it more like a city that is designed, it undesigns itself, then it redesigns itself and you can't understand it if you speed through the main highway of the city. You've got to sit down, you got to get lost, you got to smoke a BD with the cobblers and you got to know people's names, you got to know where the secret places to eat are, then you understand how this book is structured. Hi Ms. Roy, I'm Neeraj and I'm a theatre practitioner. So my question is, so you told me that you design spaces, like you see God of Small Things as a building and you see from each windows and you hear the other book as a city. So is it a conscious effort to create it, create spaces or it just happens organically as a story 
most hard work? Um, well, you know, when when I started writing the God of Small Things, I obviously had no idea what what was going to happen. So, I, I neither of the books did I start from the beginning and end at the end. You know, I don't do that. I so so I as I said, I saw this this image in my head of these two this pair of twins in a sky blue Plymouth and selling, you know, achar on the roof. And I wrote that part of the book, those of you who are familiar with where the, where the, where the thing is stopped, the car is stopped at the level crossing and this big communist uh, jatha is going past and it looked like, I thought, gosh, is this crossing ever going to open or am I going to just be this old lady who's like still stuck at the level crossing? And, you know, and then I kept trying to think, what am I trying to do here? It's like I was listening to a song, but I just couldn't, I couldn't understand the rhythm of it. And then literally I, I took a envelope and I drew something like a structure and I, suddenly understood that, oh right, so there's this one one thread that's going to be just over the period of a single day and then there's these other threads that are going across the years and that is the rhythm and the structure. Uh, similarly, in the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, it was like there, there was this baby that appeared on the pavement, there were these, these huge, uh, you know, these huge debates going on around it and these crazy things that were happening where these big big, big, big social protest movements they used to house a lot of nut jobs and crazy people they're very generous in their you know accommodation of people who fall out of uh, you know the mummy daddy baba baby life that most people have so I, I lived I lived in that for a long time and then then Anjum was the person who, who knew what to do with that baby and then you know Anjum's graveyard and it, 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 it it's like you you have a little grain of sand and then it, it starts to secrete you know the layers and layers of the story so I don't think that there's anything that I do which is either entirely designed or entirely instinctive you know it's like like even if you're if you're an artist or if you're an actor, you know, right, that you train, you train, you train until you hone your language. And then even when you're spontaneous, that spontaneity comes out of deep discipline and training. So there's nothing that's just ki, are mene socha to mene lik diya. You know, it's not like I don't believe in writing as therapy and that, oh, you know, my story is so important to the whole world. It's not. It's it's the craft and the discipline and the understanding of literature and structure that is important. Everybody's story is important to the world, but how do you tell it? How do you put your story into the context of what's going on in the world? Because you as an individual person who has nothing to do with the outside world, well, I don't need that much time for that, you know? Uh, hi, ma'am. Uh, and Deepthi Krishna, I'm doing my PhD in Gujarat. Uh, actually, it's a very fascinating kind of thing for me uh, because uh, to see you as well. So, <laughs> the question is like uh, uh, recently you said about negotiation. Negotiation is a, a, a sort of resolution to the problem of fascism per se. But uh, do you really think that is it possible for negotiation, uh, especially when it comes to the BBC documentary uh, and all, uh, where the questions are being asked, the way he responds, I mean, uh, he is very, uh, who, uh, who it meant, right? The way he responds, the arrogance, the rudeness, uh, uh, that, that itself shows that closeness to the uh, question. He's not even able to, uh, he, he's not even ready to open up. So in such a situation, uh, I would call him as a manifestation of fascism. I would say. So in that sense, is it possible for uh, um, finding a resolution through negotiation is my first question. The second one is like, uh, uh, I was always uh, interested by the character Veluta in uh, God of Small Things. So uh, though a leftist uh, by heart and soul, I, I was also thinking about the same way. Why um, uh, class, if, right now I, I could say that uh, uh, beyond the lines of class, caste has also become something very, very important. 
uh, and the people are actually recognizing even from the live stream i would say that uh, in in a, in a way they are trying to recognize it so uh, if it was in this age um, how do you uh, how do you uh, would have uh, structured beluta uh, if uh, Uh, if that is possible uh, right now by taking into consideration almost uh, um, almost the uh, almost all the things that's happening around the left movement in kerala and all how would you, you may um, i mean manifest or give a face to veluta these are the two questions that i want to ask thank you ma'am so i think you misunderstood the the passage that i read about negotiation because i'm not talking about negotiating with fascists i'm not talking about that i'm talking about how do you uh, how do you create a literature which negotiates with the reality which isn't just a billboard you know and which actually takes into account all these things and and insists on presenting um complexity and insists on living in the world not just saying i'm retreating put me in jail whatever but insists on continuing to place the complexity of who we are as against the simplifications that fascism wants us those terms you know hindi hindu hindustan which by the way are all persian words but never mind so you know that kind of thing that was the negotiation not talk about negotiating with the fascists you know uh, the second part uh, you see i think that you you know whenever the god of small things was written the book itself is set in 1968 so the it, you know rewriting it is not uh, you know that was that was a story of that time what you can't like recast it because you're in 20 23 now you know but for example the issue of caste is very much there in the ministry of what was happiness and that is 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 a different story from velita story and the character dayachand who converts to islam and is called himself sadam hussein and who's uh living with anjum in the jannat guest house and running the funeral services and who has this horse called pile who he uses to con people in various hospitals by selling them horse shoes and you know that's a different that's a different look at how cast functions you know but you can't you i mean whether the left movement is now engaging with caste or not is the problem of the left movement the po- point is that caste has preceded that by by millions of years you know this wanted to add to this because i think you know the some kind of thinking that's happening with the left about the caste question uh, which is of course many decades late but uh, uh, there is also this fact that you know that uh, uh, just like uh, aridhi said about journalists how how journalists kind of uh, uh, become part of the establishment part of the system they internalize the the so called structure and the value system i think that uh, the kerala's caste consciousness has not dramatically changed uh, i think it is uh, it's still uh, somewhere in the 50s 1950s and 40s it's still there basically uh, in our households I, i i feel that the caste question and caste discrimination is still very much prevalent I mean, this is my observation i i don't know how many of you have read uh, but there's a little book i wrote called the doctor and the saint which is about the debate between gandhi and ambedkar and you know one of the problems we have is that we are uh, willing to accept and not question things that we should question you know and uh, while one is ne- one is never at any point um not seeing what a m- major contribution uh, gandhi made to the freedom struggle you have to interrogate his views on gender his views on caste his views on the working class his views on race when he was in south africa and unless we are uh, you know unless we understand what are the i mean look at look at the percentage of people who belong to brahmin and banya caste and look in this country very minute 
But look at the control over the courts, over the bureaucracy, over the media, over the ownership of the media. You know, we do live in a sort of apartheid society which is opaque to the outside world because it's not color coded, it's caste coded. You know? Ma'am, my name is Francis. I am studying English literature in Aquinas College and I am very interested about know about your views about minority extremism. And my second question is, what is the role of Hindi language in the national integration of India? So, um, my, my views on minority extremism are that, you know, when you, uh, when you create a situation in which you corner and make a whole minority feel helpless, there is going to be extremely um, unjustifiable extremism from that community, you know, so one cannot uh, look away from it. But uh, the real problem today is that we are heading towards a majoritarian situation. I mean, now when people like myself writing what I write, and then you suddenly see huge Muslim dem demonstrations after Lupur Sharma's statement against the Prophet asking for uh, you know, asking for people to be beheaded and jailed and so on. It's just unjustifiable, you know. So, minority extremism and in, and of course in other countries, the minority is the majority and we know what those forms of extremism are that are happening, you know. So, um, I don't have any, uh, you know, I, I'm not in a position where I have to justify or understand or appreciate that extremism either, you know. One has to call out what one has to call out at all points. Hindi as a national language, well, you know, if you look at the time from the late 19th century, whether it is Gharwapsi of converting Adivasi and Dalit people and, you know, bringing them into Hinduism, whether it's Hindi as a national language and whether it's cow slaughter, all of these used to function from the same offices, you know. So it's an old project and it is a project that will never succeed in this country. So uh, it keeps raising its head and then goes down again, you know. But as I said, the, 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 cry, the cry of Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan are all ironically Persian words. That's how confused they are about themselves. Uh, my name is Joanne. I'm from Central College. Uh, what I wanted to ask you was not really a question, but let's just say um, I loved how your characters are all from broken pasts or even their present. So I loved, um, especially the last chapters of God of Small Things, how Amu and Velita found their hope and how Esther and Rahil found their hope. And I remember the words, not so clearly, but not, what they shared that night was not pleasure, but a horrendous grief. So in this world, which is, you know, it's facing an impend doom, I think, where do you find your hope? And where do you think we must find hope as humanity? Well, I, I think that, you know, those of us who, who are capable of being dangerous, like myself, are, are dangerous because we are broken people and we have nothing to lose but our effed upness, as I say. So, you know, I, I feel like we, uh, we are so, you know, to remain safe is, is to remain boring, you know. So, I don't know why so many people accept that when they know and have seen for generations, especially women, where it leads, you know. So, what is there to worry about, you know, like, just, um, just be that person who, who takes a risk, who enjoys the understanding of liberation, of freedom, of, of not being uh, molded by other people. And it's such a beautiful thing. So why not stand up and fight for what you want? It's not, it's not an unhappy fight. It's a beautiful fight. I mean, believe me, I fought it from the time I was a very young girl. And 
and I recommend it, you know, I recommend it. So, um, it, it, is, it is true that I, I, I think once at some point uh, I was somewhere, you know, in the Western world and someone asked me this question about the God of Small Things and said it's such a tragic and heartbreaking book and when we see you, you don't look tragic or heartbroken. <laughs> So I said, you know, in Hindi we have a saying ki gai ke niche gai mein likhte hain. Meaning under a picture of a cow, you don't have to write cow. Like, you know, <laughs> what do you mean by that? And I, 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 I said, you know, the point is that when you're an artist, when you're a writer, you know, this happy childhood, happy marriage, happy motherhood, happy children's day, it's, it's not worth your while, you know, for me. The brokenness, the pain, the, the, the questioning of what is this place I live in, why are these people behaving like this, that is the substance of what I write, you know. So uh, in, in your own relationships, that is so utterly beautiful, the, the understanding of the pain, the scars, the past, you know, when everything goes smoothly, uh, that's okay for normal people, but it's not okay for artists, you know, not okay for writers. I'm not saying everyone has to be pained, but even still, I think to understand, I mean, I wanted to see whether I could, you read that little bit about um, Musa and Tilotama. They had always fitted together like pieces of an unsolved and perhaps unsolvable puzzle. The smoke of her into the solidness of him the solitariness of her into the gathering of him, the strangeness of her into the straightforwardness of him, the insouciance of her into the restraint of him, the quietness of her into the quietness of him. And then of course there were the other parts, the ones that wouldn't fit. What happened that night on the houseboat Shaheen was less lovemaking than lament. Their wounds were too old and too new, too different and perhaps too deep for healing. But for a fleeting moment, they were able to pool them like accumulated gambling debts and share the pain equally without naming the injuries or asking which was whose. For a fleeting moment, they were able to repudiate the world they lived in and call forth another one, just as real. A world in which the, make, the mad people gave orders and the soldiers needed eardrops so they could hear them clearly and carry them out correctly. So, yeah, it's always about borders and broken people. Those are the ones that interest me. Hello, ma'am. Hello, sir. I'm Ambli Ravindran. I'm doing my master's in English language and literature. Actually, we have both your novels in our syllabus. And I wanted to uh, ask you a very simple question. Uh, since uh, God of Small Things is a regional literature which is take place in court time uh, i think that it hits different for the malayali audience than with the other audience uh, this is a simple simple conclusion i came across while reading reviews in goodreads and youtube uh, so i wanted to ask you about uh, if you had such an experience and some of our teachers also asked us to read the malayalam version of the novel too uh, since it's, uh, since it gives us a different light to the novel and also, I wanted to ask you whether you could give me a personal autograph in my uh, book, Score of Small Things. <laughs> well, yes, ma, I can certainly give you an autograph. And, you know, I think the, the interesting thing, not just about the God of Small Things, but of any, um, any piece of music, a Beatles song, or, a, you know, something that grows to be loved, is that everybody who reads it or hears it thinks that it was written for them, you know? And uh, I, I remember being in Estonia and this woman saying to me, but how did you, how did you know about my childhood? Because this is about my childhood, this book, you know? Uh, it's happened to, I, I remember even before the book was published, I was, uh, you know, in in a big publishing house uh, in New York where all the publishers 
uh, had come to meet me. You know, they, they, they like many publishers wanted the book, and so this was one of them. And and one of them just drawled at me in this kind of Jewish American accent. You know, you know, Arundhati, we all got ants like baby Kachama. I was like, yeah. <laughs> so it's it's like that's that's. That's how that thing works. I mean, Poland uh, guys told me, like, Ministry of Utmost Happiness is about Poland. It's not about India, it's about Poland. You know, so I think when something we love, we think it's about us. I mean, I have a more weird example of a man wrote to me once a 10 page letter, an American guy, and he said that he knew that the, that the God of Small Things was written by me entirely for him. Like it was just like this secret letter to him, you know, and he says, uh, at the end he says, uh, look, I've written this whole screenplay about it and he's like, I, I just wanted to ask you, like, can you, uh, can you give me like Rahel's love in Tokyo and I, I also need that watch of hers, you know, she has this little toy watch, Rahel, where the time is always 10 to 2. And so he says, I want that watch where it says it's 10 to 2. And then he's got a screenplay about, you know, how someone will be like, hey, Mike, what's the time? And I'll say it's 10 to 2. And they say, but it can't be, man. It's dark outside. <laughs> All this whole conversation. And the letter begins with, hello, Arundhati. My name is whatever, Mike something. I am a, uh, what was it? I am a paranoid schizophrenic who has recently been diagnosed reality-based. But I know that your book it was written for me. So I said, you know, so I think the the thing about art is that it enters you at that intimate space where it's a conversation between you and the and the and the work, not the writer, but the work, you know? Because the writer stops owning it at some point. You know, the writer stops and should not be like some some ego thing because it's always a collaboration between the writer and some kind of uh, magic, some kind of other thing. And when I say this, Marxists get angry because they don't believe in magic and other things, but I do. Hi, um, ma'am. Uh, my name is Gracious. I'm an ex-student of SH. So um, I'm one of those uh, perhaps foolish believers that you know ultimately good prevails over evil. And uh, you talked about the rise of uh, fascism in India. Um, I'm wondering if you could look into your crystal ball and visualize its fall in our lifetimes. Look, I think that I think that you know one thing that I keep telling people who lose heart is look at what other people have endured under Stalinism, under Hitler, under the Stasi, you know, we, we, are, we should not allow those spaces to close down because then we will have to endure all that. But uh, the point is for me that I don't think we should look at it as if it's a match between good and evil and what will win and what will lose because Ultimately, we have to look at all the, that's what I write about for years and years and years. What is it in this society that has led to this? Because is it going to end if the BJP loses? It's not, you know? So we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of lies we've told ourselves. We have a lot of intellectuals who lie to themselves and to us who are deeply dishonest about what is justice what is correct, what is inequality, what is going on, you know. So we have work to do regardless. And if we start just thinking about it as some election that will end it or some court judgment that will end it, forget it. That's not going to happen, you know. We've got to start where we are, not that, oh, somebody will defeat it. That's not going to happen, you know. It's, as I said, zeher kya karta hai khun mein utarne ke baad, no? The blood has the, the poison has entered now we got to we got to exercise it with our work too not arundhati roy will do it or somebody will do it or bharat jodo yatra will do it you know we got to all be out there and kerala that way is such a privileged place because you still have space 
you still have space to come out. It's it's like I can't tell you how different it is here from the rest of India. And and so we have a extra responsibility. Instead of becoming Krisangis and all the rest of it, we have extra responsibility to understand what's going on responsibly. You know, the Muslims in Kerala are not like the Muslims in UP and Bihar and other places, you know, they are they are free, they are well off, they are entitled. They must also understand what's happening in those other places, and 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 respond with responsibility, as must the Christians, because Christians and Muslims are under attack in the north of India, you know. Any more angsties? That is so rightly, Arundhati. We wait for somebody and we wait for the day. Uh, that is how exactly in India, the middle class, the educated elite are behind the Modi. So it's everything <laughs> implicit there. Uh, I don't know whether you have noticed how even extras are scared to mention the name of the leader. So the fears, our psyche is always stuck with fear. So fascism is here. I, I was thinking for a while, if you have continued with your uh, exclusive literary careerism, you would have got more awards, more recognition, and financially also better rewarding. I appreciate you, and I have respect for you because you are so bold. I have gone through your book, I mean, it's a book, uh, things that can be and cannot be said. Rather, a conversation among you, John Cusack, Ellsberg, and Snowden. That gave me a lot of uh, insight on political economy, uh, not only of India, even uh, internationally. Many things that uh, people do not know, which people should know, ought to know. Then, really, you can become more restless, see, intellectually restless. But again, what I appreciate is. Your ingredients come through your heart. That touches me. Something you made some comments on NGOs and the literary festival <laughs> there. Uh, NGOs, how the radicals uh, became um, receivers of the uh, largies by corporates. And that is true. Uh, Ford, then uh, SR, and in India, or big corporates. How they change themselves, and sometimes they become travel agents, as you said. <laughs> the secondly, you spoke about the literary festival, so-called. They are also sponsored by the same corporates. That's why you cannot take a decisive stand there. You can almost clients. And I'm so sorry about how it happened there. And again, you made a, a sarcastic comment. Uh, the tribes, how can they go on ahimsa when they do not have the arms? No, no, no. I said, I said uh, when when uh, they were questioning what is happening in Bastar and said that they should be, uh, you know, Gandhian. So I said, how can they go on a hunger strike when they don't have food? Yes, 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 yes exactly. Non exactly. violence is a political theater, but there's yeah. no one there to watch them. Exactly, exactly. I'm coming to that point. Yeah, when they are hungry, when they when you have no food, how can uh, you go on hunger strike? I mean, that is a remark. And you know, to criticize Gandhi seems to be a big task for me. They saw the liberals here, they suddenly rose against you, they began criticizing it. He has to be criticized. So, maybe you can make some comments. I mean, these are my... First of all, um, you know, you congratulated me for uh, you know, not pursuing a literary, exclusive literary career and I could have got more awards and more money. I have to tell you that I'm embarrassed by the amount of awards and the amount of money I have. You know, honestly, it, it, I keep, I keep, uh, I try to use it in solidarity, but the fact is that, um, you know, it, it isn't, I don't want to pretend like I've sacrificed something or whatever. I just write what I believe in and it is 
extraordinary how many readers there are out there who want to read it you know so i don't want to put forward some image of false suffering or martyrdom because i haven't done that i don't even believe in voluntary voluntary suffering i don't believe it because i'm not a gandhian but uh, but it is you know i mean the structures of how society works what he was referring to is you know essays and essays i've written on how as the state pulled out of its responsibilities of health of education and all the things that states are meant to do as it pulled back its spending you had these corporates pushing out ngos who work like you know like in a fraction of the money to uh, set up to do some missionary work they turn what should be people's right into aid then uh, you know all the best activists get become paid employees you have big literary festivals which are funded either by mining companies or by uh, tv companies that are completely with this hindu nationalist project and you have people going there they may even be saying radical things but they say it in an atmosphere of so much noise that it doesn't matter and it justifies all these people even more you know so for me it used to be terrible to to know that the same people who are really forcing adivasis in bastar into living in the forests because the paramilitary are coming there every night you know raiding their houses raping women and those same companies are you know sponsoring the biggest writers in the world to fly in and to speak about free speech and and you know some of us have to stay out of it to to tell that story of what's going on you know it's not that everybody or every young writer can not go to a literary festival because they know that that's their platform that's okay but somebody has to be saying yeah but this is the scheme of things this is the structure of what's going on but maybe we can just end with a i'll just read uh, from the from a chapter called the nativity which venkatesh wanted me to read from oh okay yes ma'am uh, my name is roshima i'm a research scholar from victoria college uh, actually i'm doing research on post truth on post truth okay so uh, upon reading over that topic uh, i used to get very disturbed and tense that uh, how can we actually uh, confront uh, the present theocratic nationalism of the right wing politics uh, in this post truth era and i have felt that the answer can be of of course books like yours so if it is so and if we are given a chance to choose only one option Uh, which one would you choose whether your fiction or your non fiction you know those are not uh, it doesn't matter you know what i choose the point is that what you're doing research on is a very very important and very disturbing subject you know and um i don't think that we do have uh, any simple answers to this because all research has shown that you know things that are false things that are emotionally charged these fake narratives actually get more traction than something which is le- which is more sober and more truthful and people really want to believe those things you know so i think all we can do is to first of all never forget that facts are facts you know we can't let go of that you know and we know that one of the reasons why opposition cannot be as effective as these fascist nationalist organizations is that they are prepared to be ruthless they are prepared prepared to lie they are prepared to fake things they are prepared to uh you know which is why the rage against intellectuals the rage against students not just that the rage against intelligence whether it's the intelligence of a farmer that knows how to plant a field to rage against students to rage against artists to rage against the maker because we have to ask the men that rule our country i mean i'm sure you've heard of the saying ki char log desh chalate hain do bechte hain do kharidte hain charon gujarat ke hain you know so that 
we have to ask those people, what do you love? What do you do? What do you know? What do you read? What do you sing? What poem do you like? It's just absent. Absent. We love elections. We love winning elections. I think that would be the answer. So, so we have to, you know, it can only happen if all of us are involved. If you think some people are going to do it for you, it's not going to happen. But all of us are involved in understanding, checking facts, checking what news goes out, checking what we say to our parents, checking what we say to our children, checking what books we are reading, what films we are watching. Uh, as I said, you know, putting forward every day, if all of us do it, they can't win, no? They can't win. But we just sit there as consumers of it or victims of it. Then we don't have an option, you know? So, okay, so um, this is the end of this program. <laughs> a, a, a reading from chapter three called The Nativity. It was peacetime or so they said. All morning a hot wind had whipped through the city streets, driving sheets of grit, soda bottle caps and bailey stubs before it, smacking them into car windscreens and sightless eyes. When the wind died, the sun, already high in the sky, burned through the haze. And once again the heat rose and shimmered on the streets like a belly dancer. People waited for the thunder shower that always followed a dust storm, but it never came. Fire raged through a swathe of huts huddled together on the river bank, gutting more than 2,000 in an instant. Still the Amaltas bloomed, a brilliant, defiant yellow. Each blazing summer it reached up and whispered to the hot brown sky, fuck you. She appeared quite suddenly, a little after midnight. No angels sang, no wise men brought gifts. But a million stars rose in the east to herald her arrival. One moment she wasn't there, and the next, there she was on the concrete pavement, in a crib of litter, silver cigarette foil, a few packets of a few plastic bags, and empty packets of uncle chips. She lay in a pool of light under a column of swarming neon lit mosquitoes, naked. Her skin was blue black sleek as a baby seals. She was wide awake, but perfectly quiet, unusual for someone so tiny. Perhaps in those first short months of her life, she had already learned that tears, her tears at least, were futile. A thin white horse tethered to the railing, a small dog with mange, a concrete-colored garden lizard, two palm-striped squirrels who should have been asleep, and from her hidden perch, a she-spider with a swollen egg sac watched over her. Other than that, she seemed to be utterly alone. All around her, the city sprawled for miles. Thousand-year-old sorceress, dozing but not asleep, even at this hour. Gray flyovers snaked out of her medusa skull, tangling and untangling under the yellow sodium haze sleeping bodies of homeless people lined their high, narrow pavements, head to toe, head to toe, head to toe, looping into the distance. Old secrets were folded into the furrows of her loose parchment skin. Each wrinkle was a street, each street a carnival, each arthritic joint a crumbling amphitheater, where stories of love and madness, stupidity, delight, and unspeakable cruelty had been played out for centuries. But this was to be the dawn of her resurrection. Her new masters wanted to hide her knobby varicose veins under imported fishnet stockings, cram her withered tits into saucy padded bras, and jam her aching feet into pointed high heel shoes. They wanted her to swing her stiff old hips and reroute the edges of her grimace upward into a frozen, empty smile. It was the summer grandma became a whore. She was to become the super capital of the world's favorite new superpower. India, India, the chant had gone up on TV shows, on music videos, 
in foreign newspapers and magazines, at business conferences and weapons fairs, at economic conclaves and environmental summits, at book festivals and beauty contests. India, India, India. When they finished chanting, the people of the world bowed low and joined their palms in greeting. Namaste, they said in exotic accents and smiled like a turban doorman with Maharaja moustaches who greeted foreign guests in five-star hotels. And with that, in the advertisement at least, this I just missed a part, talking about the British Airways ad where they all chant the Gayatri Mantra. And with that, in the British advertisement at least, history was turned upside down. Who was bowing now and who was smiling? Who was the petitioner and who the petitioned? In their sleep, India's favorite citizens smiled back. India, India, they chanted in their dreams like the crowds at cricket matches. The drum major beat out a rhythm. India, India, the world rose to his feet, roaring its appreciation. Skyscrapers and steel factories sprang up where forests used to be. Rivers were bottled and sold in supermarkets. Fish were tinned, mountains mined and turned into shining missiles. Massive dams lit up the city like Christmas trees. Everyone was happy. Away from the lights and the advertisements, villages were being emptied. Cities too. Millions of people were being moved, but nobody knew where to. People who can't afford to live in cities shouldn't come here, a Supreme Court judge said, and ordered the immediate evacuation, eviction of the city's poor. So surplus people were banned. In addition to the regular police, several battalions of the Rapid Action Force force in strange sky blue camouflage uniforms were deployed in the poorer quarters. In the slums and squatter settlements, in resettlement col colonies and unauthorized colonies, people fought back. They dug up the roads leading to their houses and blocked them with rocks and broken things. Young men, old men, children, mothers, grandmothers armed with sticks and rocks patrolled the entrances to their settlements across one road where the police and bulldozers had lined up for the final assault. A slogan scroll, scrawled in chalk said, Sarkar ki market chut. Gov the government's mothers can't. Thanks.